um, welcome everybody. Uh, we're really excited to, uh, to be bringing this event tonight. Uh, my name is Julie Little. I'm the guidance coordinator at the high school. And, you know, it's so exciting to see so many different faces here uh, from all grades. Uh, we have students uh, joining us tonight and we have parents. Um, so it's very, very exciting. I know we have a couple students that are coming from even the middle school. So, um, you know, it's just great to start early. Um, everybody's kind of at a different stage um, in the college process, but I think, um, you know, I think one of the things that I've learned this year is that everybody, you know, is kind of looking forward to that next step um, and is excited about that journey. So um, I really want to thank Bridgewater State University. Um, one of the things I think anybody that is on my staff knows that um, we truly, truly value the partnership that we have with Bridgewater. Um, I am here tonight with the Associate Dean of Admission and Community Outreach. Um, he has been with us um, uh, through many different presentations, has visited our high school, has helped our students. Um, Bridgewater is a very popular school with our students, so um, we really value that relationship. Um, and we're excited about the process and um, what the future holds. Uh, just a little bit about tonight. Um, we are going to be doing the presentation and then we're going to be doing a question and answer at the end. Um, so, you know, as much as possible, if we can hold off on questions until the end. Um, and I know Todd's being very gracious and he's uh, going to be taking any kind of questions that you have about the college process at the end. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to our expert tonight. Thank you very much, Ms. Little. So, uh, and thank you, Attleboro High School, for the opportunity to come and speak with you tonight. And, you know, to give the other side of the equation, Attleboro is a very important school to Bridgewater. When we look at the list of schools and the number of students that they send us every year, Attleboro has been consistently in the top 10 high schools for us in terms of uh, sources of incoming freshmen. So you know, we appreciate this partnership as well. Uh, but my presentation tonight is not necessarily going to be about Bridgewater. Uh, we're casting a broader net here. And uh, in, instead, you can see in the title of the slide here that we're going to talk about the college preparatory process in general, but specifically about why go to college and how to get there. And those are important questions. And I think probably more so now than ever, you know, these are challenging times. And I understand we have a wide range of different age groups and grades here. It's never too early to start in the college search, uh, college prep process. It's about picking classes and thinking about where it is you want to go and taking those necessary steps. So, you know, as I said, we're going to cover two questions tonight. You know, why go to college? This may not be so obvious. You know, it certainly wasn't in my house when I grew up. I was the first uh, in my family to ever go off to college. My parents had not gone to college. No one else in my family had before. And so it wasn't a foredrawn conclusion. And I think, you know, these days, especially given the fact that there's so much press out there about you know, the rising cost of college, whether it's worth the investment, you know, are there other alternatives and paths to a fulfilling career? This is an important question, I think, more so now than ever. And uh, so I hope to do it some justice with my presentation tonight. And then the second question we'll cover in, uh, in our presentation is how to get there, how to get to college. And specifically, I'm going to talk about public higher education in Massachusetts because that's my background. Uh, I've got my uh, almost three degrees from public universities here in Massachusetts. Uh, that's where I work and that's where I can speak with the most detail. But I think a lot of what I'll explain about the college admission process uh, in public higher education is going to translate to the private sector too, given that you guys might be looking at schools in that sector as well. So let's get started. Why go to college? Now, let me start off by saying going to college is not required to having a fulfilling career and a wonderful life, or it's not even required to make a lot of money, right? There are people who accomplish those tasks and never go to college. So I'm not someone who's going to make the argument tonight that you need to go to college in order to be what it is you want to be in life. It, you know, college isn't for everybody. That's why we have admission standards and there's a process uh, and there are plenty of other career opportunities for people out there that don't require degrees. But what we know and some of the research that I'll share with you guys in the next few slides is that, you know, if you're kind of on the fence here and teetering back and forth whether to go, there definitely are advantages. And research shows that especially here in Massachusetts, if you go to college, you're going to have access to more job opportunities. 
You'll also get a better return on your investment, investing in a college degree as opposed to other potential investments. And you'll realize an increased lifetime income potential as well as lifetime earning potential. So we can look at these and, and also earned wealth, which I'll touch upon a little bit later in the presentation. So to look at each of these individually here, so we, you know, imagine here on the slide, right? Uh, these look like little people action figures from when my kids were little. Um, imagine these are all the possible jobs we have here in Massachusetts. Well, for better or for worse, here in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, we are the first state in the United States to have crossed that threshold where now 50%, 50% of all jobs in Massachusetts require a college degree. That's right, 50%, which is crazy. When you consider the fact that the next closest state, it's like 35% of all jobs require a college degree. So we're in a highly educated region and especially here in Massachusetts. So if you do not go to college, then that means that you're not eligible for at least half the jobs that are out there in the job market. Yikes is right. So there is at least that fact that if you go to college and you get a degree, you're eligible for a wider range of possible jobs. Now, as I mentioned earlier, recognizing the fact that the cost for going to college is going up every year. And I'll, in the interest of full disclosure, I'm the father of three teenagers. My oldest is a senior here at Sandwich High School on Cape Cod. We are literally running down the final stretch here of his college search process. And when I see the sticker prices of schools, it's, it's stunning to me, right? And we'll talk a little bit more about the cost specifically, but you'll hear conversations with people and they'll, they'll make the case that, you know, well, I could take that money, I could invest it somewhere else. Is it really worth investing in a college degree? So let's look at this. Historically speaking, if you invest your money in bonds, you get about a 3% return rate on average, historically speaking. Similarly with the stock market, I know it's been a roller coaster lately, but historically speaking, it's about a 7% annual return. College degree, 14% return on investment. Still outpaces other traditional investment vehicles, right? So let's look at average annual income broken out by degrees, right? You get a high school diploma, average annual income, about $45,000. College degree, it bumps up to $78,000. Right? So that's a $30,000 increase. That's 70 something percent more income. So that in and of itself is also significant. But if we project that lifetime earning potential, um, if everyone else could um, please mute, just I get easily distracted. It's awful. I know. And it's late at night. Um, but thank you. And, and we'll take questions at the end, as, as Miss Little mentioned. So if we look at lifetime earning potential projected out, Again, by the highest educational uh, attainment here, you see high school diploma, you earn about $1.3 million lifetime. That's not too shabby, right? But if you move that forward and you look at the average lifetime earnings of someone with a college degree, 2.2 million. That's a difference of almost a million dollars. Not least of which is that it's also then the gateway to those advanced degrees. And you see that those tiers only go further up from there. So. Bachelor's degree is required to get a master's or a PhD or a law degree or a medical degree. So it really is a gateway to more lifetime earning potential. But really the true value, the true value of college education, I think is best stated by Albert Einstein, the quotes here on your screen. And it says the value of a college education is not the learning of many facts, but the training of the mind to think. I love that quote, training of the mind to think, right? Because too often times, I know, myself included, being the first of my family to go off to college, I was told you're going to college to get a better job, to have a better life. And that is absolutely one of the goals that you can achieve, as I've already illustrated. But sometimes I think we get too caught up then on, you know, what's the major? What am I going to study? I, I talk to high school students all the time. I don't know what I want to do with the rest of my life. People, I'm 48 and I don't know what I want to do with the rest of my life. You shouldn't know, right? It's an evolving process. But at the same time, it's hard to make the justification to invest tens of thousands of dollars on a degree without a specific purpose. So I'm going to give this quote to you to kind of ruminate on, right? Chew on it a little bit. Think about it. Because really, in education, it's training that mind to think. And let's just say, for example... Um, think about, how, you know, students, you, you've got 40, 50, 60 years ahead of you of a career. You're literally going to do jobs that we can't even conceive of. Or you're going to do jobs we know of in ways that we simply can't even imagine right now. 
let's take an example. So let's take education, right? One of the oldest human social interactions, literally the teaching of something from one person to another, okay? Parents, think back to when we were the age of our current students. You know, we, had, uh, we didn't have computers in the classroom. We didn't have Zoom classrooms. We didn't have whiteboards. No, we had, we had blackboards, you know, with the chalk erasers, and I was the dummy outside banging the erasers. Remember those, right? Okay, so if you think about education, how much that has advanced in our lifetimes, you can just imagine what the world's gonna be like for our students as they go forward. So if you think about higher education in the narrow lens of just vocational training, you can get stuck. Now, don't get me wrong. Students, if you want to become a teacher, come to Bridgewater. No better place for you. We make the best teachers and more teachers than anyone else in New England. If you want to go become a lawyer, then go become a lawyer or a doctor. But if you don't know what you want to do with the rest of your life, there's no harm in that either, right? Because if you go to school and you find something that you love, you're training your mind to think you can do whatever it is that life throws at you later on because you've trained your mind to think that's a skill set that is invaluable. So I encourage you to think about the college search process and picking your major in particular and the value of higher education and training your mind to think because you're going to be solving problems that we haven't even run into yet. Okay, so how do we get there? This is a great question. Um, let's transition a little bit for why to go and how you make that transition to getting to college. So as I said, we're gonna focus on public higher education for purposes of our discussion tonight. And in Massachusetts, we've got a lot of options. The way that higher education is structured, there's three tiers. I'll explain them for you here. There's the UMass system, there's the state university system, which includes Bridgewater, and there's the community college system. So don't worry, we're gonna delve into each one of these and explain them and what they mean. So the UMass system, as you can see here, we have every corner of the state covered with the UMass campus. There's UMass Amherst, which is the flagship campus, UMass Lowell up on the North Shore, UMass Boston in, uh, in Dorchester, and UMass Dartmouth down here in Southeastern Mass. And of course, the medical school uh, in Worcester, which just sort of covers the entire map uh, nice and cleanly. So the purpose of the UMass system is, first and foremost, they're research universities. So their faculty are evaluated based on their production of original research. If you've ever heard the phrase publish or perish, they're talking about professors at the UMass system. And so that's how they're evaluated. And teaching and service uh, is secondary to research. So in those institutions, you will have access later on in your careers to some of the best and brightest minds in their fields. But at least in the first year or two, you may encounter classes in large auditorium sized classrooms with teaching assistants or visiting lectures and so forth. So it just so that you know, that's the purpose. Now, these are amazing institutions. It's not a slight on them. It's just that they have a different focus and it's a different focus from the state university system. And again, we've got campuses across the state and some with very particular purposes. Right. So we have the Mass College of Liberal Arts up in North Adams, formerly known as uh, North Adams State College. We've got Westfield State University, Fitchburg, Worcester, Salem, Framingham, Mass College of Art and Design, Mass Maritime Academy, and last but certainly not least, Bridgewater State University. Just the fact that our logo is larger is just a coincidence. There's no purpose behind that, no subtle message. Um, but as you can see, each corner of the state, again, everyone's got a campus that's within commuting distance, and that's the way that it was devised. Now, the mission for our state universities is different from the research universities. Our focus is on teaching, which isn't to say that we're focused on producing teachers. It's confusing, I know, because it's a big part of what we do at Bridgewater. But our focus is on teaching undergraduate students as opposed to producing original research. So our faculty are evaluated first and foremost on their teaching evaluations. So technically our students are actually the boss of our faculty members. Um, and service and research is secondary. So they will stay up to date with the latest research in their fields. They may not be producing that research necessarily, some will, but the emphasis is really on what they do in the classroom with students. So I'm gonna dig a little deeper into the state university system here, just so that I can paint a, a better picture of the options that you have available, should you consider them. So at Bridgewater State University, size and setting, we're, we're a mid-sized school technically, although we're the largest of the state universities here in Massachusetts. Uh, and you can see the various campuses. We've got almost every 
possible option conceivable here in the system as you see the little icons pop up here so we have campuses that are suburban that are urban not too many that are rural i, I would say probably uh you know north adams might classify as rural we have small medium and large we have different size undergraduate populations. I mean, you could take the Goldilocks approach to college search process and there's, there's a size that fits just about any need here. So you've got a great variety and diversity in, in the offerings for the campuses. When we look at the most popular majors, you're gonna see some themes repeat themselves here. Um, when I throw these up on the screen, you know, most all of us do some kind of education. Psychology is pretty prevalent in all of our campuses. Uh, business. Business is probably the most popular major in the country, so everyone's going to offer those. But you can see the particular programs tend to bubble up on different campuses that you see here on the slide. And of course, um, Mass College of Art and Design, it is the first public standalone art college in the country. They're phenomenal for students who want to focus on that. Uh, you know, Mass Maritime Academy, if you're interested in doing anything related to the water or on the water, it should be the place that you have on your list. Um, but again, you know, there's a, there's a good crossover here. So, you know, um, just because um, somebody offers a major and it's not the largest major doesn't mean it isn't a great major. So uh, I encourage you to delve into the, the various majors for each of these campuses beyond just the, the top three. So hopefully that's a helpful resource. And as promised, the third and final tier in public higher education here uh, in Massachusetts is the community college system. And the focus here on, uh, on the community colleges is, again, different from the other two tiers in that, you know, you've got 15 campuses, again, geographically dispersed. Um, your closest to Attleboro, obviously, is, is Bristol Community College and their various campuses. And their focus is on teaching and training. So teaching students, you know, uh, in the classroom, uh, but also workforce development. And the community colleges are a tremendous option for students who are looking to get a two-year degree and out into the workforce, dental hygienists, uh, uh, certified nursing assistants. Some of these are really high demand programs and are very lucrative fields to get into. But community colleges also serve the dual purpose of being a launching pad for students who want to go on to four-year degrees at other institutions, whether public or private, right? So the nice thing about community colleges, as you'll see in my later slide, is that it's a more affordable way to earn those credits that are guaranteed to transfer over to the other four-year publics in Massachusetts. So, you know, to give you an example, at Bridgewater State University, we bring in 3,000 new students every year. Half of those students are transfers. Yeah, half. It's amazing. The other half comes straight from high school. But of those half that transfer in, half of those come from our three local community colleges. Yeah, so it's a really common pathway for students who want to find a smoother, more economic transition over to a four-year degree. And I'll, I'll map that out and what that looks like for you in one of my subsequent slides here. Oh, and then service and research, of course, is part of the, uh, the way faculty are evaluated at community colleges, but it takes a, a backseat to teaching and workforce development. So why go to a public institution as opposed to, uh, as opposed to a private? Um, well, competitive costs. What you see here on your screen is a breakdown of tuition and fees for the UMass campuses, state universities, and the community colleges. So tuition and fees is what you would pay if you were to commute from home or from an apartment in the area with friends. So you can see UMass, roughly about 15,000. State universities, about 10, 10 and a half thousand. An average for community colleges can range from 5,000 to about uh, 6,500 a year. Uh, and that's, that's for the year. And that's not a semester. That's the year. So then you, uh, if you choose to live on campus, which is an option at the UMass campuses and the state universities, then you're going to pay the additional expense of room and board. So that's your housing and your meal plan. So total cost all in, uh, it, you know, for the UMass campuses, it's about 28, 28 and a half thousand a year and at the state universities about 22 and a half or 23,000 a year uh, and, and community colleges housing is not an option so we just carry the tuition and fee costs over so relatively affordable at least when you compare it to the average cost for a private college or university here in Massachusetts running anywhere from 40 to 75 thousand dollars a year which is Stunning, I know. <laughs> um, I will say this though, you know, I'm not entirely biased to the public sector. Um, there is a phenomenon now in higher education uh, that occurs more often with the privates is that they'll give a shocking sticker price, right? Uh, you see them here on the screen, shocking sticker price. But 
they give merit scholarships, they give financial aid, and very seldom do average people pay the sticker price. You're going to pay something less. So my advice to folks in early on in their college search process is don't get scared by the sticker price. I know that sounds crazy, right? Because my own institution, we've got a huge cost uh, competitive advantage, but don't sell yourself short. So students think about, you know, what you want to do for a major, think about size of the school, how far from home, you know, go visit the campuses, get a sense of the field, apply to everywhere you think will be a good fit. But before you do that, students and families sit down together and come up with a number that you can reasonably afford as a family. And then think about what your life looks like should you decide to take student loans in addition to what you can afford and stick to that number. Of course, I say that we're now getting acceptance letters from, from my oldest son now, and we've gone through this exercise. And inevitably, we're gonna have that conversation once he has his fistful of acceptance letters and his financial aid award letters, and we're gonna have that tough conversation. But you know what? We're sticking to the number. But he's not selling himself short. We don't know what he's getting for financial aid until we get the financial aid. So wait till the spring of your senior year to make that final decision. Apply to where you think's a good fit, see where you get in, and then see what you get for financial aid. So that would be my advice. It's the advice I give to my own kids and we exercise as a family. I encourage you guys to do the same. It should hopefully avoid some additional tears in the spring of your senior year and you're, you're staying within the bounds of acceptable financial burden. <clears throat> so why do state universities cost less than privates, right? You got to wonder, because we live in this world where there's the assumption that if you're paying less, it means you're getting less. So as a state institution, we do receive a portion of our budget from the Commonwealth, from your tax dollars. And it's not an insignificant sum. This year at Bridgewater, well, I should say last year at Bridgewater, we received $67 million from the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. It accounted for about 33% of our annual operating budget. And we try to use every dollar that we get wisely. But let's put that in a historic perspective. So for example, when I was a student in the early 90s at what was then a state college here in Massachusetts, and yes, that's me, I'm the one without the beard. And uh, <laughs> at that point, the state was putting 80% into my education and my family and I were picking up the other 20%. Uh, unfortunately, that ratio has since flipped, right? In the intervening decades. But whether you decide to enroll in a public institution today or back in the day, in either case, you're receiving value which is quality relative to cost, right? You're literally getting more than what you're paying for because the Commonwealth is investing in you and in your education. And it's not just the $67 million last year, 33% of our operating budget. No, it goes back to when they were putting 80% into my education because it adds up over time, it's cumulative. So if you think about it, the buildings that were built since then, well, they still stand. The facilities that we've outfitted have probably only been updated since then. And many of the faculty and staff that we've hired are still contributing members of our community. So my point is, when you go to public higher education, there is a ton of value way beyond the sticker price. So again, if in your college search process, you encounter somebody who tries to convince you that because you're paying less, it means you're getting less. Well, they simply don't understand the economics of the situation. Hopefully you do now that you guys have seen this slide. So who wants to be a millionaire, right? Who doesn't want to be a millionaire? So in putting this presentation together some time ago, um, you know, as luck turned out, my wife said, hey, you know, have you seen this new book? You know, we, we were going through financial planning, getting ready for my son to go to college and everything. So I want to share this book with you guys. This is a book written recently by an author, Chris Hogan, entitled Everyday Millionaires. So what Chris did was it's one of the most comprehensive studies of millionaires in America. Now, the way that he defines millionaire is not just somebody who makes a million dollars and blows it out the door on boats and bubble gum and Lord knows what else, right? And his definition, a millionaire is somebody who literally has a million dollars. So if you walked up to them and said, I'm holding your beloved for ransom, I need a million dollars. They could literally, they could sell their house, their cars, their boats, their bank accounts, their retirement, and they would have a million dollars cash that they don't owe to anybody else. It's literally a million dollars cash. So he looked at these millionaires through a bunch of different lenses. And one of them was he looked at what was their highest level of education. So this is going to be, this is going to blow you guys away. So here we go. So we're going to put this out here in terms of how many people, you know, if we were boil this down, if we had 10 people in a room, what's the percentage that's represented by each level of educational attainment. So 
one out of 10 millionaires in his study never went to college. Told you, if you can become a millionaire, you don't have to go to college. One out of 10, right? One out of 10 went to a community college and that was the extent of their education. Went out, became a millionaire. One out of 10 millionaires went to a fancy pants private school or university. Yeah, one out of 10. So what does that leave us? Seven out of 10 millionaires in America have their degree from a public university or college. Seven out of 10 millionaires in America went to a place like Bridgewater State or UMass Amherst. Crazy, isn't it? I attribute that to the fact that those students have, that they have finance on their mind when they're going to school, they manage their debt early on in life, and they were smart about their money going forward. Where you start absolutely has bearing on where you finish. So you don't have to go to the fanciest, most expensive college or university to become a millionaire. You have to have a millionaire mindset and starting off in public higher ed ain't a bad way to go, according to the odds. <laughs> so again, why go public? So a couple of years ago, there was a lot of talk in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts by policymakers to want to get a $30,000 degree. It is absolutely obtainable. I know it might not make sense based on the earlier slide that I showed you, but I'm going to walk you guys through this here, right? So let's say, for example, you wanted to manage your debt and you didn't want to have to owe tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of dollars to get your degree. In this scenario, you could do your first year at Bristol Community College and pay about $5,000 a year. Get your first year done. You can go there for your second year. Again, another $5,000. So there you go. You've now got an associate's degree. You're about $10,000 into your education. First two years are done. If there are various programs that we offer at Bristol Community College, the Mass Transfer Compact, we have BCC to BSU. There are a number of different programs that if you get a certain grade point average and a number of credits, you're guaranteed admission to Bridgewater. And I'm sure there are similar programs at other state universities in the UMass system and also special scholarships. But that aside, you do your first two years, 10 grand. Transfer over to a place like Bridgewater, you continue to commute, $10,500 a year. Finish out your senior year commuting, $10,500 a year. Do the math, carry the one, you're at $31,000. You just earned not one, but two degrees for $31,000. Now, let's say, for example, we play this through and you go, okay, well, I'm willing to make the sacrifice and I'll go to a Bristol Community College for two years and commute, but I want the traditional living on campus experience when I go to Bridgewater. That's great, absolutely do that. Transfer over, apply to become a residential assistant. It's one of the best kept secrets in the world. I was an RA, my wife was an RA. At many places, they either waive the room and board or they're gonna pay you an hourly rate that's comparable to the cost of room and board. So either you're getting free room and board or you're getting the financial equivalent of it and you're paying your bill. So you're still at $10,500 a year potentially. Now, I, I don't want to discount the fact that $31,000 is a lot of money. I don't have $31,000 sitting on my nightstand ready to throw at my 18-year-old in a couple of months, right? This takes some planning. But think about it, students. How many of you are currently working part-time jobs? I'm going to bet you were like me, and it's going to be several of you, right? So let's play this through. If you were, I've done the math on this. If you work 12 additional hours per week at minimum wage, you're going to earn $31,000 in four years, you're graduating debt-free, you own your education. Now, I know if you're currently working to help pay other bills or for your car or, or what have you, 12 additional hours might be a lot, but this does not count for the fact that you can work 40 hours during the summer, okay? So don't let anyone tell you, you can't afford an education. You absolutely can, you'll earn it. You'll do it the old fashioned way, you'll earn it. So, all right. Let's talk about the admissions process itself. Hopefully I've made the case. There's, there's benefit to going to college. There's benefit to thinking about public higher ed. I'm gonna to talk to you now about how you get in and what the admission process looks like for public higher education, for state universities in particular. So public universities here in Massachusetts, we all get the same admission standards from the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Department of Higher Education gave us admission standards probably about 25, 30 years ago. We all use them as at least the minimum. So it's public information, you could probably Google it, but I like to give insider information when people come to my presentation. So I'm gonna spell it all out for you guys. I'm gonna save you the Google search, okay? All right, so the single most important credential that you're gonna to send to us as a public university is gonna be your high school transcript. 
without a doubt. Now, uh, people spend a lot of money and worrying about things like, you know, SAT prep or, you know, send your kid off to the best AAU teams for whatever sport they're playing, or you send them to the Caribbean for a service trip. Those are all great, but nothing trumps a transcript. And the philosophy is that your past performance is the best indicator of your potential future success, bar none. And that is system-wide here in Massachusetts. So the, the first thing we're going to do when we get your transcript is we're going to look for specific college prep courses. And I'm going to tell you, the staff at Attleboro are fantastic. We never have issues with students missing prerequisites, but I'm going to share them with you now just so that it gets in your head. Uh, and especially for those younger students who might be in middle school with us tonight for the presentation. So be thinking about this. We're going to look for four years of college prep math, four, uh, English rather, four years of college prep math, which is a relatively new increase. It had been three. It's now four years of math. Uh, so that includes Algebra 1, Geometry, Algebra 2, and another advanced math, like statistics or something like that, pre-calculus, -calc calculus, that kind of stuff. Three years of a lab science, two years of a history or social studies, two years of the same foreign language. You put a pin in that. I'm going to circle back on that in a second. And then two other college prep electives. So again, we do the math. We're looking for 17 specific college prep classes. If you're missing any of these, you're not eligible for admission to a public four-year institution in Massachusetts with the exception of the foreign language. There's actually three exceptions there. I'll explain them to you here real quick. One is that if you are English as a second language learner and you've got an ESL for English in your freshman and sophomore year, but then you tracked into college prep English for your junior and senior year. I mean, let's be honest. If you can speak a foreign language at home, you know, you don't have to take the class. I have a hard enough time with English. I admire anybody. My wife speaks Spanish. It's amazing to me. Uh, you know, kudos to you. You don't have to do the courses. Okay. So then the other exceptions are that uh, if you have a learning disability, it's language processing based, and you disclose that to us in the, in the admissions process, checking it off on the application, or you send us your IEP or your 504, that will waive the foreign language requirement as well. Third exception is if you're in a voc tech track, right? Because let's be honest, again, if you can do electrical work and not blow yourself up, I don't care if you know French, I'm impressed, right? And so is the state. You know, learning a trade is much like learning a foreign language in many cases, so that can be waived as well, especially in places that don't offer the foreign language as an option. And we see that at Vogue schools a lot. But in, in any case, if you're missing any of the others, we, we can't admit you. This is the foundation for college prep, and it also so happens to align to the requirements for graduation in many of public high schools in this Commonwealth, too, so it works out kind of nice. So then the next thing that we do, assuming that you have those 17 classes, is that we're going to recalculate your grade point average. Now. The state standards require us to convert it to a 4.0 scale, which is probably pretty familiar to you guys. So four is an A, three is a B, two is a C, you get the idea. But it's going to be different from your high school transcript in two important ways. One is that we're going to recalculate using just your college prep classes. So in other words, there's going to be no gym, no health class, no wood shop, that kind of stuff. The second way that it's different is that we're using a weighted GPA. So by that, I mean, if you're taking it in honors class, that course is going to get weighted half a grade level higher. If you take AP, International Baccalaureate, or dual enrollment, those get weighted a full grade level higher. So I'll give you an example. You get an A and an AP, you're getting a five on a 4.0 scale, right? So the state allows us to reward you for taking a more challenging curriculum. Now, I said the high school transcript is the most important document because we can actually admit you based on your GPA alone, meaning we don't need test scores. We don't need to read your essay. That's it. So what's the standard to get into a state university? I'm gonna share this. UMass system is gonna be a little bit higher, right? But for the state universities, 3.0. Be average, there you have it. If you got 3.0, you're good to go. Again, we don't even see, need to see test scores. The state allows us to admit you based on your high school performance alone. So I usually get one of three reactions from students at this point when I share this slide. They're either like, yes, or they bury their forehead into their hand like, no, or you stopped listening to me 15 minutes ago. Because let's be honest, I mean, it's late, it's Wednesday night. If you're not paying attention, I don't, I don't blame you, right? So <laughs> if you find yourself in one of the latter two categories, okay, don't freak out because you should still absolutely apply to a state university. That's when we get to use the sliding scale. You see it here on your screen, okay? Sliding scale's got three columns. Uh, the furthest one on the left represents weighted GPAs, and there's six different ranges here, right? It starts from a 299 down to a 2.0. The idea is that you plot roughly where you think your GPA is gonna be, and then you slide to the right on the sliding scale, where you see the corresponding required minimum standardized test score. 
SAT and ACT. We would accept either one of them. So the idea is that if you meet or you exceed that number, you're in. Congratulations, right? Pretty straightforward. However, if there are any seniors in our event tonight, you know nothing's that straightforward this year, right? No, because they keep canceling these standardized tests on us because of the pandemic, my son included. So no worries, Bridgewater State University has been test optional for about four years, but this year, everybody is. Heck, Harvard's test optional. So when Bridgewater's ahead of Harvard in a national trend, we're really heading in the right direction, people. So <laughs> it's fine. In this case, test scores can only help a student in the admission process to Bridgewater State University. I would assume that it might be similar to many other state universities. My point here, though, is that you do want to check with each campus. So, um, but at Bridgewater, anyway, our test optional is no one's ever going to get penalized for test scores. They can only help you with the sliding scale. Now, again, if you're below a 3.0 and you're still not matching up on the sliding scale, please still absolutely apply. Don't let this chart determine your fate allow us admissions professionals to make an informed decision. And I say that because the state standards allow us to enroll up to a certain percentage of our incoming class exempt from this sliding scale. We, however, do it very, very carefully because the last thing we want to do is admit a student who's not capable of getting out with a degree. There are privates that do that and they churn and burn and they just want your first or second year's tuition and fee payment. We're not in that business. We're not going to waste your money or the taxpayer's money. So when we do make a special admit, it's done based on a careful reading of things like your personal essay, your letters of recommendation, and your list of extracurricular activities. Now, I just want to stop here and I want to clarify what I mean by extracurricular activities. Yes, I mean sports teams. I also mean clubs and organizations and certainly community service. Those are extraordinary things but there are also opportunities that not everyone can afford. So when I talk about extracurricular activities, we also want to know, do you have a part-time job? I know I did in high school. Do you have to hustle home to take care of younger siblings or sick parents or elderly grandparents? This is essentially your opportunity students to let us know whatever it is that's going on in your life outside of the classroom that's keeping you from being as successful as you think you can be if you should be admitted to a state university here in Massachusetts. I'll also mention too, this year for the first time, Bridgewater is also offering optional evaluative interviews. Now this piece of advice is going to be applicable whether you're thinking about Bridgewater or anywhere else, but students, I urge you, if the schools that you're interested in are offering interviews, do them, absolutely do them, because it gives us an opportunity to get to know you beyond the two dimensions of a GPA and an SAT. It allows you to articulate your story beyond just a personal essay, and you get to find out more about the institution in a very personalized, intimate fashion in an interview process with, quite possibly, the person who's gonna review your application. So please do the interviews if that's at all possible. Now, I spent some time on this slide and I wanted to explain in some detail about the admission process for state universities because I know, I know firsthand, I'm living with it. The college application process is scary enough, right? And you go to these presentations from people at private colleges and universities and they'll give you this line, you'll hear this. Well, we give a holistic reading to the application and you know what? That's great. Like, I don't know what you're talking about. I know what each word means, but you string it together in a sentence. You've literally just told me nothing. <laughs> I have told you everything. Okay. Because the world's scary enough. You don't need to be scared about applying to a public university. Okay. If you still have questions about how these standards apply to you in your particular circumstances, you can call us in the admissions office at Bridgewater or whatever public institution you're interested in. And I'm sure that they can put you in touch with somebody who is happy to talk through your particular circumstances and how it relates to these standards, right? So there you have it. In closing here, before we turn it over to opening it up for questions, I hope this has been helpful for you guys. I cannot emphasize enough the importance of you guys visiting your local publics, right? So go check out UMass Dartmouth, check out Bridgewater, check out Bristol Community College. One of the most important steps in your college search process is literally stepping foot on campus. Now, I hope everyone here tonight can make the pledge that you don't pay a deposit on a college until you've seen it for yourself. And I say that, of course, because I'm in the business. Like, I know. We all put our best face forward on our websites and we show the beautiful buildings and our brochures. No one's gonna show you the ugly corner of campus, right? So you can see these places for yourself. And of course I say that, Bridgewater shows are great. I'm hoping you come and check us out. 
but these are your local campuses. These are driving distance. You know, even now we're offering one on one tours. So one student to one tour guide, you bring your family or what have you, but we keep it small and there's physical distancing. You wear a mask, you don't go in buildings, but at least it gives you a sense of the place. Hopefully in the fall when we will open up to full in person again, you're going to see the place in full swing. You get a sense of it's the culture and the feel and the kind of students you want to be around. Do that for all the schools that you're most interested in. Um, it's an important an important step that certainly shouldn't be missed just because of a technicality like a global pandemic or whatever. <laughs> so, so there you have it. Um, I'm hoping that this was helpful. We covered a lot of ground. Um, so let me do this. I am going to uh, turn off my slides here. And I am going to welcome any questions here. I'm just going to scan the chat real quick. Um, yes, so setting up tours, almost any campus, you, you go to their main page, you go to the admission page. We all try to make tours, you know, pretty, you know, top tier. I know at Bridgewater, it's our URL, which is bridgew.edu backslash campus hyphen visit, I think. But it's pretty easy. You'll, you'll be able to find it. Um, study abroad. Um, what would public institutions offer? It's going to vary. I'll be honest. It varies from institution to institution, whether it's public or private. Um, I know it, in Bridgewater, personally, we have 75 study abroad programs in 35 different countries on six continents. The only continent we're not on is Antarctica. And as soon as the Penguins organize into a university, we're, we're going to be the first one down there. Um, but public or private, it doesn't much matter. You know, that, uh, if you're interested in doing study abroad, it's a tremendous opportunity ask each campus that you're interested in applying to early uh, and they'll be able to answer those sorts of questions for you. Uh, great, great question. So I touched a little bit upon that transfer process. So the reality is, let's say, for example, you're late in the game, you're a junior or you're a senior right now, maybe you're missing too many of the prerequisites or maybe your GPA is low. You, you, maybe you don't feel like you're uh, financially ready or emotionally ready or academically ready, whatever reason you go to a community college transfer process is so much easier than coming out of high school. Let me tell you, first of all, you can, you can transfer out of a community college after your first semester. True story. I mean, the, the fact is though, if you have less than 24 credits and below a C minus average, we're still going to look at your high school stuff. But if you go off to Bristol Community College and you killing it right you just you found your groove you just need to I don't know, get away from your friends you need to hit the reset button you just need to get clear of covid whatever go to bcc if you have a two five or higher with 12 or more credits you're in baby we don't even need your high school transcript it's that literally it's that easy so it's so so much easier for students you know it, it, don't get me wrong this past year it's been awful like i've got three kids one of them is an extrovert, he's got attention issues, like he feeds off energy of other people. You put him in front of a screen all day, he's like drool out of the corner of his mouth. He's just like, cannot stand it. He's not alone. There are some students, this format is a nightmare. And kids' grades are gonna suffer, I, I get it. Don't think that that's gonna keep you from getting to where you wanna go, right? It may be a, a sidestep, take a detour, go to a community college, but that doesn't mean you can't do everything you wanna do. This is the thing. When you get out into the workforce, no one's gonna ask where you started your college education. No one's gonna care. They're gonna say, what have you done lately? What's the, what, for your first job, they're gonna ask where you went to school. After that, nobody cares. What have you done lately, right? So you constantly have the opportunities to show the world who you are. You're not defined by this moment. You're not defined by this moment. You're defined by what you do next, what you choose to do next, okay? So stay focused on that. I know these are hard times. This, this ain't forever. All right. So how do you get sports scholarships at public universities? Good question. So public or private, doesn't matter. It's the same system for everybody. And it's rules given to us by the NCAA. So what they do is uh, they've got different divisions. There's one, two, and three. Give you a sense. So one, division one, those are the, those are the schools you see on TV. Okay, uh, Division One schools here in, in Massachusetts, UMass Amherst, Division One, uh, Boston College, you know, um, BU, Northeastern, those are all D1. Some of the other publics, for example, like UMass Lowell, I think they're D1 hockey, but maybe, you know, other divisions for other sports. So you want to check with each campus. Now, D1 athletics, that's where you'll get the real, potentially, full scholarships. Although there's a myth, you know, you get a scholarship, they're not all full scholarships, okay? So I've seen a lot of people who spend tens of thousands of dollars to groom the world's next best swimmer. They get D1 and they get like $2,000 a year scholarship. 
great. I got to pay the other 70,000. So, um, you know, and that's just to put athletics into perspective. Okay. So then there's D2. D2 can also offer scholarships. Full ride are like unicorns in D2. Very, very rare. Okay. And it's funny because my, my son's an athlete. He's got some friends who are going D2 and you know, it's nice. You get a couple of thousand dollars and it, it certainly helps. They're usually smaller, private, I tend to see them there. They tend to be more Catholic colleges and universities. Those are the D2. So you get a little bit of money there. D3, student athletes, no money. Cannot get athletic scholarships. You can get scholarships. You're eligible for financial aid. You just can't get scholarships based on your athleticism. So it's a true student athlete. And those students are participating for love of the game and for the connection that they get to their teammates. Those are lifelong bonds. They get to represent their school. They get to structure their day more. They actually tend to be more successful academically. I personally, huge fan of D3 sports. I played D3 when I was in college, wouldn't trade it in for the world. It was great. I would have paid money to pay, play sports. I didn't care if they were giving me something or not. So hopefully that, that helps give you the landscape. You want to check each school, D1, potential full ride, D2, you get money, but very seldom full ride. And D3, you're playing because you just love it. You just love it. So let's see what else we got here. Oh, what's the cost for state schools out of state? That's a great question. That's a great question. So as I explained, uh, I gave you guys the breakdown for in-state costs at a public in Massachusetts, right? Because your tax dollars are helping to float that difference that we talked about. So let's say, for example, you're interested in a public university out of Massachusetts, okay? So typically what ends up happening is you're paying a little bit more than what their in-state students are paying, but you're still paying less than if you're going to go to a private, okay? So our college is going to kind of, you know, give some consideration to maybe some dips in a transcript given COVID and online learning. Yeah, that was yeah. No, thank you. And it's funny you asked. I have like a whole 30 minute presentation on the college search process in the COVID era. Uh, happy to come back and do an encore performance because this is such an important topic. You know, it really, really is. So let me help put this into context. So we all get it. This pandemic has been a nightmare, a nightmare. Not just the fact like, you know, we got to, you know, you're on Zoom classes. I mean, people's lives have been seriously, people have died. Half a million people have died. People we know and love have died and had a ripple effect that is going to absolutely translate into what we see on a transcript. We have to have to be realistic of that fact. So a couple of things have changed. So one in terms of state policies, one is that we've all gone test optional as a state system. Fortunately, the privates have also done that. That will probably, I'm suspecting schools that weren't test optional, it's going to linger. So when you start looking at the transcript, however, so some schools, they did pass fail last year when things went virtual. What the state has determined for state universities is the students cannot be penalized for pass fail courses on their transcript. So what we do is I told you, it's important we see those 17 college prep classes, right? Well, if you get a passing grade in one of those requirements, it meets the requirement. We're not gonna penalize you because it went pass fail, right? Even though the, the minimum pass for many of those classes might be 60 or 65, well, we're not going to calculate your GPA with that. That's terrible. I mean, you, you might have gotten them straight A. It just happened to show up as a pass because that's what your school decided to do. So we're going to exclude those courses, the pass-fail courses in your GPA calculation. Now, if your school did pass-fail for a semester and then they reported out a final numeric grade for that class, well, we'll use the numeric grade, especially if it's working to your advantage. That's fine. Uh, but you're not going to be penalized for that. Now, again, you know, we see trends. We look at trends on transcripts. Bottom line is that we recalculate. And so the recalculate GPA is what it is. If you're not matching up with the 3.0, or you're not making it in the, in the uh, sliding scale, then we will look at a trend line. I, I've looked at applications myself where, you know, student was killing it the freshman and sophomore year, things got a little shaky junior year, and they just hit the skids going into the senior year. It looked bad. So that's when I'm asking myself questions like, what's going on here? What's the story? You know, if we haven't had the opportunity to interview that student, then we're reading the essay. We're looking at the letters of recommendation. You know, if the story there is that, you know, it, student had a tragedy uh, or COVID particularly affected them, we're taking that into consideration. You know, the common applications, Bridgewater's on the common application now. It has a question. The common apps used by 850 colleges and universities around the country literally has a tailored question asking how COVID has impacted your life. We're ready to hear this. We want to hear this. But I will tell you, if you've hit the skids going into your senior year and you're on the bubble, it, it may be one of those situations where you're better served going to a community college just so that you can get back on your feet and get your bearings before you, you make the double investment in tuition and fees to go to a four-year public. 
Uh, so we've had to make those decisions too, um, but always with an eye towards what's in the best interest of the student. Nobody wants to set you guys up to fail, which is to say, again, <clears throat> you know, where you are today isn't where you're going to end. We just got to be realistic about it and, and, and send you on a path that's going to lead you to, to where it is you want to go. What I'm hoping, though, is that this has been helpful. And then this is the start of an ongoing conversation you can continue to have with your excellent guidance staff at Atterborough High that I'm happy to continue should be interested in Bridgewater. Um, but hopefully this is planting the seeds for you, some, some questions to ask in other contexts, and hopefully it's giving you a basis in which to, you know, forge forward with all the courage you need to make the world a better place these days. You know, honestly, students, um, it is easy to get caught in that rut and be overwhelmed with all of the terrible things that have happened in our world in the past 12 months. And it's been a nightmare uh, on so many levels. Um, but I'm telling you, there is no better way to get out there and make a difference in the world by getting your degree and you know, training your mind to think to solve these problems. Because I'll tell you, students, it ain't us. We have messed this place up. <laughs> you guys have got to get out there and fix this and make it a better world for all of us. So, uh, so I'm hoping that this has helped get you along your way.